Hi friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan. In case you guys didn't know, Solo A Star Wars Story is finally released for the home audience, and also there's a novel. And that's basically what I've been doing all week. That's why in our last video, I went very extensively into how the Empire affected the Carillion economy. It wasn't really until I picked up the novel and watched the movie again that I remembered just how deep this movie gets into Star Wars lore and how many new things it introduces and how many things it revisits. If you guys are a big fan of the original trilogy, you'll probably enjoy this a lot more than The Last Jedi, and while it's just as entertaining as Rogue One, Solo definitely feels more Star Wars-y. That's a real word. Probably not a real word. Anyway, I am a little biased. After all, I inspire to be like Han Solo in real life, but this is definitely one of my favorite films to come out during the Disney Star Wars era. Now, one of the coolest things the film introduces is a giant space storm known as the Acades Maelstrom. It's Disney's new take on the famous Kessel Run. Today, we'll be taking a closer look at the Maelstrom, figure out what exactly it is, and if something like this could actually exist in real life. You guys know I love backstory, so before we get into the science bits of this video, I kind of want to take a look at the lore of the Maelstrom, or more importantly, the Kessel Run. And in order to do this, we have to dip into the expanded universe, which is what the solo writers use for inspiration in the first place. In Legends, Kessel is wedged in between Hut Space and the Outer Rim. It was this misshapen lump of a planet that was extremely hostile to all types of life, it hardly had any atmosphere on it, and was populated by soul-sucking spider monsters. Terrible place, and to make matters worse, Kessel was situated in the middle of a celestial body known as the Maw. This was an extremely dense cluster of black holes and other gravitational anomalies, and required several micro hyperspace jumps to safely navigate through it. Which probably leads you to ask, why the hell would anyone want to go to Kessel in the first place? Well, two reasons. One is that the Empire and many factions before and after it operated max security prisons on the surface of the planet. The second reason is Kessel has a huge deposit of spice, and he who controls the spice controls the universe, or, or just becomes an addict. Kessel had one of the most expensive spices in the galaxy known as Glitter Stim. One of the side effects of the drug was it granted users temporary telepathic power. Long-term use made you into a tweaker. That's basically classic legends for you. A little bit dark and a whole lot of crazy. Anyway, not only was the journey through the Maw incredibly dangerous, the Empire also patrolled the area because they had a monopoly on the spice trade and didn't like smugglers cutting into their supply. So when Han Solo says that he did the Kessel Run in 12 parsecs instead of 18, what does he mean? Well, it's not what you think. You see, a parsec is not a measurement of time, but a measurement of distance. One parsec is over three light years. So Han Solo not only cut down the time of his journey, he cut down the distance as well. He did this by traveling through hyperspace very close to black holes well outside the safety margins ships normally would use during a Kessel Run attempt. It also should be noted that he was smuggling illegal spice and he was being chased by a Star Destroyer which probably made him go even quicker than he really wanted to. So that's basically the Legends version of the Kessel Run. So now let's look at how the Kessel Run is portrayed in the film. It's a bit more spherical, which makes sense for a celestial body that large, and it's still known for its spice mine full of slaves. And now the Pike Syndicate are also harvesting raw coaxium from the planet, which is essential to the solo film's plot. And in order to get to the planet of Kessel, you still have to go through the Kessel Run. But now the Maw Cluster is just one large gravity well at the center of a large galactic storm known as the Acades Maelstrom. While the original Kessel Run focused on a series of hyperspace jumps, the Cades Maelstrom was even more difficult to navigate, and most pilots flew through it at sublight speeds with only a few small micro jumps through hyperspace. This kind of makes sense from a movie maker's point of view because it just looks cooler and it makes the situation a lot more tense. The Maelstrom is mostly made out of interstellar gases, but also has millions of large ice chunks and carbon bergs the size of planets randomly flying around it. There are also extremely dangerous electrical storms. This means in order to make it through the Maelstrom, pilots have to stick to the few tunnels that carve through the storm. We're not really sure if these tunnels are naturally created and just permanently stay there, or if they're artificially created by someone, which is possible because there are small light probes that kind of line the whole way. So how realistic is the Cades Maelstrom? Could it exist in real life? Well, yes and no. What the Maelstrom sort of resembles is a nebula. These are giant clouds of interstellar dust and ionized gas. And just like the Cades Maelstrom, they can be extremely large, many hundreds of light years across in size. So how is a nebula created? Well, you see, space is not a perfect vacuum. Even in the darkest and most remote parts of space, there are still one or two molecules per cubic centimeter. Eventually, these small individual atoms will combine together and over the course of billions and billions of years, eventually clump together in a large enough size to create a cloud of gas. 
Eventually, that nebula will become so massive that the gravitational pull will crush the molecules into each other and set off a nuclear reaction. And that's how stars are born. It's also how babies are made. You see, it's not when a mommy and a daddy love each other, it's just an accumulation of matter that eventually becomes sentient. That is just a theory though right now, so don't let that take away from any of the other sciencey things I spew out of my mouth. So if we take a look at the maw, it's not all that different from the center of a nebula, with an extremely dense core that is a gravity well which is starting to crush matter. Where a normal nebula differs from the maelstrom is its density. A nebula cloud the size of Earth would only have a mass of a few kilograms. The densest part of most nebulas only have 10,000 particles per cubic centimeter. In comparison, our atmosphere here on Earth has 10 to the 19th power molecules per cubic centimeter. That's like a hundred trillion times more dense than a nebula. I think. The Cades Maelstrom, from what we can tell from the video, is extremely dense. So much so that the storm is opaque in many areas. It's definitely more dense than the average nebula. Now, if any of you guys have ever walked or driven through a cloud, you've probably experienced a much less violent version of what you see in the Acades Maelstrom. This storm's extremely dense gas clouds represent something one might see on the surface of a gas giant like Jupiter. So what is the difference between a gas giant and a nebula? Well, it comes down to mass. You see, Jupiter would need to be 80 times heavier in order to produce enough heat to form even the smallest of stars. So the problem we end up having is the Achates Maelstrom is way too dense for something that large. It takes 12 parsecs to shoot through the Achates Maelstrom in a relatively straight line, which means the entire storm is several light years across. So there are nebulas the size of the Maelstrom, but they're not going to be as dense, because if they are that dense, most likely they would have already turned into a star. Now, of course, I'm making all these assumptions based on visual observation. We have no numbers or measurements. Although, to be honest, even if we did have them, I probably wouldn't be able to make any sense out of them because I'm not a rocket surgeon lawyer. So maybe the Maelstrom is a nebula on the verge of having enough mass to create a star. There are also other types of nebulas that have similar characteristics as the Maelstrom. One type is called the Planetary Nebula. It's created when an aging star's outer shell begins to expand. The cloud of gas in the accretion disk is much more dense than what we normally see in a nebula. Of course, the Maelstrom in Solo is not expanding, but being sucked into a black hole. There's another more rare type of nebula known as a Dark Nebula. These are made out of dust clouds and gas clouds that are so dense that they're opaque. Dark Nebulas can only be created in certain situations, usually after a star with a short lifespan dies or supernovas. The Maelstrom is also similar to the accretion disk of a black hole that is tearing apart a star. This creates a violent vortex of gas, radiation, and energy that the black hole is sucking in. The problem here is that the Maelstrom lacks a nearby star, which is necessary for an accretion disk to form around a black hole. If Kessel is orbiting inside of the Maelstrom and the Maelstrom is an accretion disk around a black hole, it would only make a few orbits around the center of the mall before it's pulled apart by gravitational forces. There'd be no time to create a slave colony or a spice colony of any kind. As far as I'm concerned for Star Wars, this Maelstrom actually makes a whole lot more sense than things like the Force or Space Whales or Wookiee not eating something as delicious as a pork. And more importantly, it's epic, and it adds a lot of atmosphere and cool factor to the film. So I'm okay with the Maelstrom, especially because it's Star Wars, and Star Wars is all about fantasy, not science. And science kind of sucks sometimes because it hurts my brain. My brain hurts a lot after doing all that research. I'm actually surprised by how many correlations I was able to draw from the Maelstrom to actual real-life celestial bodies that do exist. Now we aren't completely done yet, I want to look at a few more elements inside the Maelstrom. The Carbonbergs and Ice Blocks, how realistic are they? Well, it certainly is possible that the Mars gravitational pull has lured in some comets into orbit and that there's a wide belt of debris surrounding it. Not really sure what a Carbonberg is, it could be a giant chunk of, I don't know, diamonds or maybe it's dry ice, but I do know it probably can't be planet size. I think that's a bit of a stretch because, you know, that close to a uh, giant gravity well, it probably would have been pulled apart. What about the electrical storms? Can there be lightning in space? That's another yes. All lightning really needs is a medium for it to travel through. On Earth, we have an atmosphere, and in an extremely dense storm like the Maelstrom, there's ionized gas. What about the tunnel that Han flies through? Is it possible for there to be a permanent structure like this inside of a nebula storm? Well, we have mentioned how the Maelstrom kind of looks like a storm on Jupiter. And Jupiter does have a relatively stable tunnel-like structure known as the Great Red Spot, caused by two opposite jet streams. It's over 350 years old, and while the gas around the eye of the storm is moving at around 400 kilometers an hour, the inside of the storm is quite peaceful. So I guess it is kind of possible for there to be a safe passage like a tunnel through a storm like that. 
Although the tunnel we see in Solo is probably way too small to be the eye of a storm that large. Another thing we have to mention is the inside of the nebula would most likely be extremely hazardous and full of harmful radiation and energy. Star Wars never really explains how ships are shielded, so maybe we'll just give them a pass on this. Now the only really big issue I have with this scene is the scale of everything. We only really see L3 jump into hyperspace once on the way in, and according to this crudely drawn map, which kind of looks like something you would find on a paper placemat at a diner, the pathway through the mall has many turns, so sublight speed travel is the best way through. But if the trip is 20 parsecs long and they're traveling at sublight speeds, it would take many lifetimes for them to make it through. Well guys, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. I definitely enjoyed making it, even though the research made my brain hurt, because again, I'm not a rocket surgeon or a space scientist. So if I did make any mistakes, please do point them out in the comment section below. Also stay tuned by subscribing. Who knows, maybe we'll do a video where we try to figure out if this could actually happen in real life. You're not gonna wanna miss that. Well guys, thanks for joining us today. If you're watching this, you are Generation Tech.